In fact, just over 50% of all nesting from Diamondback Terrapin females occurs around a three hour window around the high tide each and every day throughout their summer nesting season. Lastly, we're aware of factors which influence their crossing behavior. And this is something that we're starting to tease out with our future causeway management strategies. So we're starting to learn that factors like vegetation on the road changes the propensity of these animals to cross and thus potentially be struck by vehicles. Lastly, a management tool we've started using here on Jekyll shortly after the inception of the Sea Trail Center was that of nesting boxes. So in areas of high density crossing, we're building these attractive nesting habitats to intercept females prior to reaching the road. If you look on this picture, at the bottom of the screen, you can see an adult female diamondback terrapin actually leaving a nesting box after successfully nesting. In sum, three of our prior management actions were that of roadside habitat alteration, the addition of nesting boxes in specific areas along the causeway, and these flashing warning signs. Uh, the roadside habitat management in certain areas, we saw a drastic 40% decrease in nest predation of eggs laid on the ground. With the addition of nesting boxes in 2011, we built a large structure of nesting boxes along the Cedar Creek Bridge site, and that saw a 60% reduction in terrapins on the road and an 80% reduction in nest predation. Additionally, in 2013, we added two of these flashing terrapin road signs on our causeway, which are triggered around the high tide when these animals are attempting to cross the road, and that has seen a 20% reduction in vehicle strikes along our causeway. However, despite the variety of these management actions we've applied, these populations of terrapin are still predicted to decline. Thus, an inception in a collaboration with Animex was born through communication with Dr. Terry Norton. Animex is a United Kingdom-based environmental engineering group that focuses on combining biological understanding of animals' needs with environmental construction and engineering principles. So in such, what we're planning on doing is we're going to utilize a fence to safely exclude diamondback terrapin from crossing roads in order to both reduce road mortality and increase population levels. And factors we're planning on monitoring are the behavior of these individual female terrapin when they approach the nest, when they approach the fence, and what their reaction to that fence is, where they nest, how they nest, and how successful they are. This fence is going to be installed at the western end of the Jekyll Island Causeway. It's going to be between 12 and 16 inches off of the ground. It'll be monitored by personnel, Georgia Sea Turtle Center staff, myself, AmeriCorps members, and game cameras like these you can see here, which we've used in prior research to examine nesting success along nesting boxes here on Jekyll Island. Again, here's a picture of that Cedar Creek Causeway nest box with individuals entering the nest box. These are electrified with electric wire to stop predators and raccoons from entering these nesting boxes. To determine the optimal site for this nest, I analyzed 14 years of road survey data here on the Jekyll Island Causeway, where we've seen over 6,000 encounters since 2007. 1,121 of these encounters, approximately 20% of all of our encounters of diamondback terrapin on this causeway occur in these bright red areas on this map which indicates the most dense areas of road crossing. This is the far western end of the causeway, just by those two ponds and those iconic towers as you enter Jekyll Island. Future directions for this fencing is planned installation is actually beginning today. After this meeting, I'll be joining Cliff Garan and the landscaping crew on the causeway. We're gonna be monitoring this extensively during the nesting season using game cameras and various personnel, and we hope this will contribute to the management of similar causeways throughout the region. In short, one thing that I want to hammer forth is that this short 1,000 feet of fencing is gonna potentially impact roughly 20% of all animals we've ever encountered on the causeway, which in a very small area will have massive conservation implications and help boost the population here on Jekyll Island and serve as a model system to be adopted by causeways throughout the Southeastern United States. One of the main benefits of this project and one of the things that I think is most important is the massive collaborative effort that we've undertaken so far. This has been a joint effort with seven different departments here at the Jekyll Island Authority, including support from the Jekyll Island Foundation for funding, Animex International and AmeriCorps. So I think it's a strong model for group work and collaborative conservation. With that, if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you, David, for that report. Thank Hearing you. Hearing no questions, uh, 
That concludes our report. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. At this time, we'll open the floor for any comments from the public. Please limit your comments to three minutes. <coughs> Hearing none, we'll move to the Finance Committee and let it be noted that Chairman Wilkinson has arrived and I am turning the chairmanship over to Chairman Wilkinson. Thank you. So we're now going to Bill Gross and the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, include, I'll be going over the uh, February financials. The uh, revenues for February were $2,367,782, which was $478,000 more than budgeted for the month. Year-to-date revenues reflect a favorable $4.3 million variance from budget and a favorable $6.1 million variance from prior year-to-date. The two areas with the largest variances from budget were parking revenues, which were 82,000 higher than budget for the month. Weather was beautiful and it brought in a lot of people to enjoy the island. Lot rental revenues were 180,000 better than budget due to sales and resales at the moorings property. Golf revenues were 50,000 higher than budgeted, uh, largely due to the nice weather. Marketing and the event revenues were 47,000 higher doing uh, due to the 75th Asori event. Expenses for February were $2,028,889, which was $329,000 or 14% less than the budget for the month. Year-to-date expenses were $1.7 million less than budget and were $5.2 million more than prior to year-to-date expenses. Largest variances for the month were human resources, which was $169,000, uh, under budget due to the vacant positions, both full and part-time. Advertising and sales were 97,000 uh, due to basically timing issues. It's anticipated these funds will be spent by the end of the fiscal year. Dues and subscriptions were, were under budget by 38,000, which is a correction of an expense from January, which was a missed code. Net operating cash income for February was $338,893 which is $807,000 better than the budget net operating loss of $468,299. Year-to-day net operating cash income is $6 million better than the budget and $3.6 million better than prior year-to-date income. February traffic stats, uh, total traffic count for February was 101,657 vehicles, which was about 18,400 more vehicles than February of 2021. Revenues from annual pass sales and online pass sales were 11,000 better than last year and sales at the gate were 71,000 better than last year. Hotel stats. Uh, February uh, of this year, revenues reported by the hotels were 3.9 million, which is 2.1 million more than February of 2021. This is a 109% increase in revenues. Occupancy rate was 59%, which is 14.6% higher than February of 2021. Uh, revenue per available room was $104.11, which is up from $61.53 in February of 21. Average daily rate, $176.55, which is up from $138.67. Calendar year uh, 2022. Year-to-date revenues reported by the hotels was 6.1 million, which is 2.6 million more than year to date, uh, 21 revenues. Oxy rate was 46.8%, which is up from 39.9. Revenue per available room was $77.05, which is up from $54.59 for year to date. Average daily rate was $164.71, which is up from $137. Um, dollars. Um, February was a strong month. Uh, weather was beautiful. Um, that's the financial report for February. At this time, I'd like to get uh, ask Marjorie Johnson to come and do a presentation or a request for EMS training equipment. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So our um, fire department would like to purchase a SIM mannequin. Um, this mannequin would be used to help build proficiency and uh, practical skills for our EMTs and paramedics. They would be able to uh, 
this one mannequin, you would be able to start IVs, do CPR, defibrillations, medication administration, and airway procedures. Um, it's an advanced interactive system, and it creates real-life scenarios for them instead of just, um, you know, using training. Um, it would create real-life scenarios for them to monitor. Um, it also captures the decisions and actions of the EMT and provides constructive feedback. And by purchasing an all-in-one uh, mannequin, they'll be able to do all of these procedures on one mannequin instead of buying multiple training aids for that. And the cost of the equipment is um, $8,800, and it would be paid from the fire equipment fund. Any Very questions? Good. Very good. Um, Marjorie. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis is here today, and mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, it would be good for you to, um, uh, or Dennis, one to speak to the fact that um, uh, we actually have the best training equipment around with our fire department and EMS. Yeah. Um, and and for instance, the um, um, I don't know what it's called, Dennis, but the um, the automatic um, uh, heart. Um, chest compressions. Thank you. <laughs> right. If you could just update the board on this, I think it's impressive that uh, we're we're one of the leading fire departments in EMS uh, services around. Yes, sir. Certainly, with, with your your all support, we have been uh, doing very well with that. Uh, this particular device uh, actually works and interacts with uh, what Mr. Hooks is referring to as. I think a couple of years ago, maybe about two, two and a half years ago, uh, we purchased the uh, Zoll Auto Pulse, which is a mechanical device that does the, the compressions during CPR. Uh, this was a very unique device and a very good device for us. A lot of reasons is we have a lot of uh, places that have elevators, stairwells, things that restricted us from being able to do uh, chest compressions and restricted areas. Not to mention, um, there's not quite as many people working uh, over here as there are uh, on the mainland. So we particularly can run into situations where we have uh, minimal staff and available. So this device kind of takes the place of a person. It's mechanical, it uh, runs off a battery, and it certainly uh, is, is efficient. It runs uh, nonstop. So it doesn't get tired. It doesn't have to, if we work in a small space. So normally if we were to go down a set of stairs, we'd have to stop CPR. And with this device uh, that he's referring to, it will actually do the CPR while you're going down the stairs and in elevators and tight spaces. So moving over to the what's at hand today is, is uh, we had uh, budgeted for these individual pieces like arms and legs and heads to do these training uh, evolutions on to practice our skills. And uh, this device that we ran across, uh, it was actually a conference that was here held on, in this uh, convention center, uh, brought it all together. They, they offered one device that uh, is also connected to a piece of software that uh, monitors the treatments. It gives the scenarios in real time. It changes the heart rhythms. It actually, you know, the patient presents however you like them to present. And uh, we certainly want to, you know, have realistic training for uh, our folks to keep them uh, top notch like they are. And uh, we, we felt like this would be a very uh, productive and, and, uh, service for many years to come. So uh, all those individual pieces add up to nearly that amount, but having them all in one piece makes it more realistic. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Any questions? I'd be glad to talk about it. Okay. Is there a motion to recommend authorizing the purchase of the all-in-one SIM mannequin for the purpose of EMS training as recommended by Marjorie Staff? So moved. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, second by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Post. Um, we will now open the floor for any public comments. Public comments are limited to three minutes for each person. Okay. I'm going to move. Well, let's see, uh, Dr. Evans, we have no report on human resources, I believe. Is there no report? Uh, there's no report this month, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. So next we move to the Marketing Committee. Joy Birch Meeks is the chair, and she will open the Marketing Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
this morning, Alexa is going to come, our director of marketing and communications, and give us a quick media recap of some great news we've had lately, and then look forward to some upcoming events. Alexa. Thank you, Joy. Oops. Sorry, I hit the wrong one. Nope. <laughs> okay. So I hadn't given an update um, recently about some of our um, PR efforts. I know I've talked about this previously. Obviously, we um, invest a lot in growing our PR and media outreach. Um, and recently, we had some wonderful highlights that I wanted to share with you all. I'm sure at this point, you've probably seen um, the Traveler's Choice Best of the Best um, designation that came out from TripAdvisor. And they do this every year. It's um, They look at destinations, beach locations, et cetera, around the U.S. and as well as um, around the world. But recently, um, we were listed as number six for um, their best beach locations. Of course, it's Driftwood Beach. Um, it's always Driftwood Beach. Um, but we were excited this year to see that um, in, in previous years, we've never really broken the top 10. So um, this year, we were number six on the list. And if you look at the um, list of locations, we are the um, only location aside from one other on the East Coast. And several of these are, are um, beach destinations in Hawaii. So I think that's certainly significant. Um, and it's important to note that these um, designations are solely based on um, reviews from visitors who have come here. They leave those reviews on TripAdvisor. It's generated by the public. Um, so those designations are not anything that we pay for. Um, and I think it's also important to note that with Driftwood Beach on this list, I've talked about it previously, um, but I wanted to reiterate that aside from situations like what, what I'll talk about in a moment where you see Driftwood Beach featured, we do not do active marketing of Driftwood Beach any longer just because of the recognition that it has received. So it's really more passive recognition. Um, you'll see it every now and then. And in media efforts through photographs, you'll see um, it on social media. But that is something that we look at, especially as we, we look at capacity management and trying to make sure that we're not overcrowding our beach destinations. So that's just something important that I wanted to note. Um, and then I also wanted to share, we had um, recently, just as of this past week, a wonderful spread in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution um, in their Sunday paper, HB, Eight Beach Getaways. Um, and Jekyll Island was actually featured as the first listing there. They um, did a wonderful mention of the new Marriott property here. And of course, um, what a time to to come as you're planning for your vacation for the summer. So we were excited to have that. And then in addition to that, we also hosted a writer back in October. Um, we worked with the state of Georgia. They brought um, a writer down to the coast and visited several destinations here. Um, but one of them was a, a stopover on Jekyll. And we were uh, able to host that writer and get him into a stay at the Jekyll Island Club Resort and have him visit the Sea Turtle Center, our museum, and really learn about the history here on Jekyll. And so that writer was with National Geographic, and they just released their April magazine. So that's the cover right there. And there's a wonderful spread about the Golden Isles um, and the coast of Georgia. And of course, the, the um, hero image is, is our wonderful Driftwood Beach. Turtle crawl. I know you guys are all excited. You're already registered. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to bring this up because I know we talk a lot about the events that we have on the island. This is certainly one that we have been um, fortunate to continue on for several years. Um, April 30th is this year's turtle crawl, but I did want to mention turtle crawl was actually the very first event that we had to cancel due to the pandemic. So it's exciting to see that this is returning to Jekyll Island. Um, last year, we had to go fully virtual, so we we are excited to welcome runners back to Jekyll for this event. Um, so far, in the last three and a half weeks since we've gone live with registration, we have 471 participants registered um, and over 2,300 donations to date. Um, last year, we had a little over 900 participants total and around $4,000 in additional donations um, from those registrations. So. We are pacing to, you know, exceed those numbers. So I'm excited about that. 
Um, and I did just want to mention that we, you know, we offer all registration uh, participants a commemorative t-shirt. We have a deadline for that. And the URL is jekyllisland.com slash turtle crawl. So we're excited to be hosting that on April 30th. And we moved that timing back to April because we want this to sort of be a celebration, a celebratory event to kick off nesting season, which starts May 1st. Alexa, um, just for clarity, uh, the fact that the registration fees are in addition to these donations. Yes, correct. Sorry if I if I confused anyone, but we uh, the registrations are part of the donation, but we also offer the option for people who, when they register, they can provide an additional donation, and so that is donations separate of registration. And then lastly, I wanted to give a quick update on The Color Purple, which is going to be filming on Jekyll Island. I, um, I think that there's been some conversation online already about it. I shared a couple of pictures here that have been shared on social media about some sets that they're building. So I wanted to just quickly update you on where that stands. I know at the last board meeting I mentioned that the newspaper had announced um, a casting call we had not formalized a contract at that point. Um, we are actually finalizing a contract um, and hopefully we'll have that finalized in the next day um, with them. And then they are slated to film on Jekyll the 20th of March through the 28th. Um, and they will be filming off of a side road that is not general public access. So it shouldn't have too much impact, but they will also be filming at Driftwood Beach um, and I wanted to give this update because this it's I've talked about this as well, but it's important for you all to to um, just be reminded when these productions come in terms of how we look at um, economic impact and how we evaluate when these productions are coming. Generally, we um, look at things like nesting season, wildlife impact, what's the economic impact in terms of will the cast and crew be able to um, you know, fill up our hotels or are they staying off island, things like that. Um, and then just the general impact to the public. We certainly don't want to, and we look at this when we're looking at film productions, we don't want to have a big film production here for several weeks in the middle of the summer and have it um, reduce the experience for visitors who are coming here to vacation. So those are all things that we do look at. Um, and you know, when we finalize the contract for this, I think that we'll be um, able to say that this had a nice economic impact with a low visitation impact. So um, we're excited to, to certainly have them here. They've been great to work with so far. Um, and then we will be sending out public communication, kind of notifying the public of some road closures um, that'll take place and um, other things for them to be aware of while um, the production's taking place. And if no one has any questions, that concludes my report. Alexa, I actually have a question that may be um, more for Jones. The, Jones, are we responsible for security um, when folks come to film? Alexa, you want to respond to that? Um, so, Joy, uh, when, they, when this production comes and when most productions come, they are responsible for um, requesting their own security. And I do know that this film production already has GSP lined up to help manage um, the road closures, to help manage security and safety of the film set. Um, we, we also require them to manage their own um, waste management or trash collection, bathrooms, all of those things. So majority of those services are, are provided by, uh, or are resp the responsibility of the film production. Every now and then they will request some services of us course we charge a fee for that but they um typically will bring that stuff out from the from outside thank you no problem again a great report um if there are no other questions mr chairman that concludes our report thank you uh, we'll now open the floor for any public comments public comments are limited to three minutes for each person and i don't see you are here so move to the legislative committee um, with Trip Tolleson. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tolleson is unable to be with us today. So I'll just provide a quick update. Um, uh, most recently we were in Atlanta um, with, the, um, with the Golden Isles Chamber uh, for 
uh, Golden Isles Chamber Day, but also during that time we were making uh, various uh, appointments uh, and visits with legislative members um, of the Appropriations Committee on both the uh, House and Senate side uh, regarding the, um, the requested um, public safety complex funding. Uh, we also, um, during that visit, met with uh, Commissioner Mark Williams, uh, who's been very supportive uh, of this particular uh, request. Uh, as you know, it, it uh, falls within the Department of Natural Resources from a budgetary uh, department standpoint. And I'm very pleased to, to um, share with you today that as of last Friday, that uh, the monies are, are contained in the... Um, in the um, uh, FY22 amended budget. Uh, so now we're, we're just waiting uh, uh, for the final um, sign-offs there. Um, and we, of course, have special thanks to not only uh, Mark, but also to uh, Chairman Terry England and Chairman Blake Tillery, uh, as well as the Chief of Appropriations Staff, uh, Martha Wickton. Uh, she has been a super friend to the Jekyll Island Authority, and uh, and so I wanted to be sure and share that with you, uh, Commissioner Williams. You're on the phone uh, still. If you have any comments on this, maybe he's not still on the phone. John, yes, sir. did you say Mark? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't. It was sort of muffled. Uh, no, I guess. Um, we, we've just been moving through our budget process for uh, FY23, uh, um, and all that looks good from a department standpoint. But uh, just just glad it's uh, glad it got included, and uh, looking forward to getting everything signed. Like you said, thank you, sir. So, as a result of this being in the amended budget, Mr. Chairman, that's uh, that's the impetus for why we have been coming to you in the past uh, couple of months uh, looking at um, funds that were needed to for the site clearing and and for some uh, uh, tweaks in the um, in the um, uh, um, design uh, because we realized that it would be imperative for us to move this project forward very quickly uh, so uh, stay tuned a lot more on this thank you mr chairman that that concludes uh, the report unless there are questions questions I'm going to uh, go to uh, open the floor for any public comments. Public comments are limited to three minutes for each person. But um, I am very, very grateful for the hard work by everyone uh, in, the, in the legislature and, and here on staff. It's so, so much, uh, it's very much needed. And that We'll close the legislative committee, I believe. And then um, we're going to go to committee of the whole. Is it Glenn calling next? Yes, sir. Okay, Glenn. Mr. Chairman, today I'm delighted to that we have uh, Glenn Coyne with us. <laughs> He is with the um, consulting group of GMC. He is a senior planner. Uh, as you know, we've been working with GMC now for several months on updates uh, uh, to the uh, code uh, uh, of the Jekyll Island Authority. Um, and, uh, and we thought it would be um, uh, well received today to have Glenn just give a general update since, uh, um, as you know, we, we had a change in uh, in legal counsel uh, during this process as Melissa moved to Charleston. And so, um, so we, we're running a little behind, but not, not too terribly behind because uh, Glenn and his team have been continuing to, to work on this project. So he's going to give you an update today. Glenn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jones. Good morning, uh, members of the board. Again, Glenn Coyne with uh, GMC. And I will be brief. I'm going to go through very, um, uh, just a top of the trees kind of look at what we've been working on. Um, there's a lot of work in the background. Um, I just wanted to remind you, last time I spoke with you in October, just to lay out what we are doing, um, and that is updating the, the codes that regulate development uh, 
and um, what would typically be called zoning in another community um, are our um, development codes here on Jekyll Island. There's a lot of administrative procedures in there that we've adjusted and improved. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we try to reflect new technology. There's things that have changed in the, in, the, in the marketplace since the code was adopted the first time. So we wanted to make sure that we looked at that, but we also are trying to make sure we respect what keeps Jekyll unique and what makes it um, the history and the, and the nature of, of Jekyll Island unique. We've reorganized um, the, the code into chapters so that things that are similar are grouped together so that you don't have to hunt and search throughout the entire document to find um, regulations, for example, that all re relate to residential uses are all in one place now. Things that relate to business and commercial are all in one place now. And it's just a, a better organization. Um, and this has all been through identifying the issues through um, the professional staff um, here with the authority, which have been really great to work with. We've had uh, public input, which I'll highlight in a second, and then our staff's review of the code and what other best practices are out there in the marketplace. What we're not doing, importantly, is we're not changing anything about where you can develop on Jekyll. We're not adding new areas of development. We're not changing the map. Um, we are simply just rewriting the codes that regulate that development on the island. So we're not, we're not changing anything as far as uh, areas of development on Jekyll. Just a few key uh, indicators I wanted to get um, in front of you so that you could see we um, have two public meetings. One happened in July and one is scheduled to, um, for April. Right now the tentative date is April 12th. Um, we'll advertise that as appropriate when that gets finalized. Um, we also did an online survey where folks um, went on the Jekyll Island website and responded to a series of questions and gave us some really good feedback about um, the different codes that we were looking at. I mentioned the staff um, here at, the, at Jekyll Island Authority and we've had great workshop meetings with them. We have another one this afternoon to um, hopefully answer a few of the final remaining issues that we're working on. And then Jones mentioned Melissa, she and I had uh, bi-weekly meetings scheduled where we checked in uh, every other Monday afternoon and made sure that this project was tracking and that we were moving along and that was very helpful. Um, all said so far, we have over 240 pages of text. And as I mentioned, that's organized into 10 chapters that are by topic. So just to give you an idea, some examples of the things I just wanted to um, show you the breadth of the types of things. This is not an exhaustive list, but just some of the highlights. Um, obviously here on Jekyll, as you've already heard today, the natural features, the environment, the resources that you have here that are special, um, we really felt like some of those ordinances that address those type of things and protect those things uh, be updated. So you see a list here, um, adopted a, co a coastal stormwater supplement. Um, we did add a sea level rise ordinance so that in the future as the, as the level of, of the um, sea rises as is if it should, um, there's something that we um, incorporated called a rolling buffer. So that way there's always um, a buffer provided from that um, uh, high level, the sea level. So if that changes over the future and that's monitored, it's built in that that buffer would, would happen. We also incorporated a three foot um, freeboard for floodplain. That means your finished floor elevation uh, of, a, of a new home or a new building needs to be at least three feet above that minimum floor, uh, flood elevation. That just gives people extra protection um, in the event of a, of a flood event. So um, it, it was sort of being done, but we've, we've documented it now. Firewise is a very important, um, very well established and well respected um, way to make sure that uh, debris and and trees and limbs and things and all those type of things that could be fire hazards are monitored and maintained and, and we've adopted those recommended that those as standards be adopted and then we took a very careful look at litter um, something called a clean community ordinance so that there's some good um, enforcement uh, for uh, folks who feel like they need to come here and litter uh, we'll make sure that that doesn't happen we spent uh, I don't know how much time on the tree ordinance. It's a very major part of the, of the codes. It's the longest single chapter, I think. Um, because it has uh, plant lists, it has materials lists, it's very specific as to the types of trees and plants and material that we'd like to see um, maintained and replaced on, uh, on Jekyll. So um, we did, there's a lot of um, code language about how to maintain your trees. 
how to maintain your landscaping, where you can trim, where you can't trim, certain sizes of trees that are designated as um, important to protect. So uh, suffice it to say, there's a lot of language that regulates um, trees. We've also, for the first time, established a Jekyll Island Authority Tree Mitigation Fund. That means that any kind of penalties that are assessed, that money will stay here on Jekyll uh, and be used to mitigate any, any types of loss of trees. So, um, so that's very important. Residential neighborhoods is probably the next um, longest chapter and very important chapter. What we really wanna do is try to maintain the character through the codes of the residential neighborhoods. And so we've incorporated a lot of administrative procedures, how you apply for a permit, what the process is to review that permit, who looks at it, who approves it, and then, and then how it's inspected as, as the property is renovated or built. Um, we also looked at things like how you park vehicles on your property. Where do you put your boat? Where do you put your RV? Um, how does storage happen and what should it look like on these residential properties? So that, that was something that was um, mentioned in the code, but we've strengthened that. The design review standards is something that um, is really how we enforce maintaining the character of Jekyll Island. And we wanted to first and foremost, protect the existing neighborhoods. So we're looking at things like building heights, limiting, how any new homes or replacement homes or renovations of existing homes, how high they can go. We're trying to limit that from not being out of scale. Similarly, lot coverage, we don't want somebody to come in, lease a lot, and then just fill it up with the entire lot with homes and accessory buildings and, and parking. So we're trying to limit the area of the lot that you can disturb. And again, the ranch style homes is our, uh, our benchmark here to look at what's existing and how to protect that through the, through the codes. And finally, in the residential area, we wanted to take a careful look at home occupations. This is something that's always been popular, but with the, um, the pandemic, it's even increased, more people working from home. And um, even though there's a lot of folks here that may be retired, there are uh, what we call cottage industries that are happening. So we've identified which one of those uses are appropriate to happen in a residential unit we don't want any change to the character of the house to happen um, because of it. We limit how many people can visit you per day, how the parking happens, things like that. Um, we prohibit large trucks from either originating from or delivering to um, a house. So there's a lot of things in there that let you do an office or limited types of things, but, um, but not have a full-blown business running out of your house and is the simplest way to, um, to describe that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turning to the legitimate commercial areas, uh, again, we had a lot of standards in something called the design guidelines that were sort of recommended that we pulled into the, uh, the, the commercial code. So again, as with the residential I mentioned, in the commercial area, it's much more uh, strict. There are eight specific steps you take if you want to do a commercial building. Um, from everything from plan review down to final occupancy. So um, it's very detailed engineering drawings, architectural drawings, how those are reviewed. It's a very detailed eight step process. Um, so we, we've, we've codified that, it's there, it's, it's um, for people to follow. The other thing that we've looked at and uh, talked to Zach this morning already, and he's spending time in this, is the alcoholic beverage uh, ordinance. and. Um, we want to make sure that what we do here on Jekyll is consistent with state law, but um, we also realize that it, there's some other special um, uh, alcohol, um, there's special events, there's interest in having an outdoor carry uh, in certain very limited areas. So we're looking at those types of things to implement um, alcoholic beverage regulations uh, on Jekyll. The other, the other part that we heard from um, through the staff and from the public and in our research was that there's a lot of folks that are coming on to Jekyll to conduct business that are not leaseholders on the island. So you see examples of it, people who come here to perform uh, services like landscaping or cleaning swimming pools or, or similar, um, bicycle and kayak rentals, um, tourist charters, things like that. So they come onto the island, do what they do and then leave. Um, there's a real interest in simply getting a registration process for those folks, having them pay an annual fee and have them give proof of insurance. That's really what it, what it boils down to. Um, just to be on fair uh, ground with the folks that have legitimate businesses here on the island in a physical location. So 
not everybody can have that here. You know, there is a need to come on the island, do the service, and then leave. But we want to make sure that the folks are protected who are using those services. So that's why we have the registration and the fees and the insurance. So that's a that's a um, reg what we call regulation of non-leaseholders on the island. Building codes is a very important area. Um, we have a lot of building codes that are adopted already. There were a series of newer ones that Jekyll Island needed to um, adopt. Again, this is an international and a state um, set of codes that are updated regularly. And so what we've done is listed all of those that are applicable to Jekyll and said, as amended, they become uh, the rule here on Jekyll as well. Um, and we also established and clarified the relationship between Jekyll Island Authority and Glynn County on building inspections and, and how all that happens. That was uh, sort of happening, but we, we again codified it. And then the other thing we did was added a new district. Um, there's a series of residential districts that allow you to do certain density or certain types of um, housing by district. And it was proposed to add a new one called Plan Development District. So should new development come to Jekyll Island or if there's a piece of property that, that is gonna be developed, um, we're strongly advocating that that go under this plan development uh, category where uh, the, the applicant provides a site plan, a narrative, a complete schedule. Um, everything is laid out ahead of time to show what that development's gonna look like. And that could include a mix of uses or densities within that development, but we feel like it's very important that it coordinate with the surrounding area and it doesn't just sit out on its own, that it that it is something, that, as it describes, is a planned development. So that's been, that's been recommended. Um, one of the... Uh, um, Glenn, so maybe a comment right here, because um, as you've said, there's no advocacy here for additional development. Uh, and I think it's uh, important for people to understand uh, the planned um, development um, community that uh, Glenn was just referencing. Um, actually, we, you, we utilize those uh, type regulations whenever we were working with the Ocean Oaks project. So that's a good example of, of what um, uh, happened uh, with that project as far as landscaping and, and uh, various issues there. Um, knowing that there is a project that is the one that is north of the Marriott, which we still have not gotten the concept on or anything like that, but knowing that that project um, has been from the marketing study that we required um, recommended uh, not a hotel property, but instead a, a um, development, a housing type development, then this would become very important as we begin to look, go down that path. Is that not a true statement? Yes, thanks for the clarification. Yep. Thank you. Um, another, another topic that arose uh, in our research and discussions is um, the issue of folks uh, going off of their particular leased piece of property to, uh, to encroach into either a right of way or authority property or open space. Um, and the idea is sometimes they trim a tree or they'll extend their lawn a little bit or they'll build a fence. And the idea is that um, little by little, these may not be a big deal, but as they accumulate, all of a sudden, uh, it becomes a big problem. So we wanted to address this issue of, of encroachment off of leased property onto the either adjoining or, or different piece of property. So um, one other thing that we found out when we were looking at this is that sometimes people don't really know where the boundary is. Um, they have a, a written lease, and sometimes there's a drawing that goes along with that, but we are advocating that... Um, uh, it might be time to require a property survey. Um, and as you can see on the slide, it would only happen during certain triggers. Um, if you apply for, if the property is transferred, you know, if you buy a piece of property in another community, typically there's a property survey. Um, if you amend your lease, uh, if you apply for a building permit or a tree um, permit, and then if you get one of those certifications for your flood level, we're, we're advocating that eventually the island should be covered by these uh, survey, property surveys. It just helps everyone know where their boundaries are, help where the street um, right of way, for lack of a better word, is. And um, it just will help down the road when there's property disputes. And so um, 
we're the, the language that we've used is that that property survey should be somewhere between two or five years old, um, no older than that. So it doesn't mean you have to do it every single time, but if you have a survey that's that's within two or five years, um, and we haven't decided that number yet, we will for the final code, um, then you're good to go. But the idea is just to begin to establish uh, where the property lines are throughout the throughout the island. Um, then what we can do is turn that into a electronic map. Um, we can use technology to then track that and, and make sure that, that um, we're keeping track of where the properties are, where these encroachments happen. Um, what, we did with, what we did with the lease property is uh, also then put in some penalties, although we were very careful to have it be a scaled um, uh, enforcement leading to penalties. So there's, there's ways that people can mitigate it without um, getting into a whole lot of trouble if they voluntarily correct whatever the encroachment is. So we've established all of that in the, in a new chapter that we're called uh, leased property. And that's unique, very unique to Jekyll Island. Um, and we think that that's gonna be a real help um, for folks down the road. Finally, uh, historic preservation. We, uh, there's a lot of historic preservation that already happens on the island. You have a committee of your board dedicated to it. Um, I don't need to really go into much with that, with that, but what we wanted to do is two things. One, formally recognize the official historic districts um, that exist, and then begin to lay out what would happen if there are future historic districts down the road. Um, it may be hard to believe, but some of the neighborhoods here on Jekyll Island are or are fast approaching 50 years old, and that's the benchmark and threshold for something to be potentially considered historic. So um, as some of these mid-century neighborhoods become 50 <laughs> years old, we thought it was very important to establish the procedure that if, and a big if, um, there's some designation down the road, there's a procedure and a public process for how that would happen. Um, and so that's what this section of the code addresses. Not advocating that that happens, but if it does, establish the way that it, it, would, it would go about. So how do we get to the finish line? Uh, Jones mentioned we've been working since um, July of last year. I talked earlier about the public meeting, which is tentatively scheduled for April 12th. And um, then what we are hoping to do is get the codes ready for your first reading uh, at your meeting in May and the second and final reading at your meeting in June um, so that we can get the, the codes onto the books. Um, and again, for those that are interested, we are posting um, updates at the Jekyll Island website under a special um, section that deals with the code revision. And I just wanted to close by saying, um, again, as I always do, thanks to the staff. Um, the, they've been wonderful in, in reviewing our drafts and giving us really good comments. Um, I wanna thank Zach in advance for him jumping into this and, and reviewing the codes from the legal standpoint. And then to just let you know that when we're finished, um, you're never really finished with the codes. There'll be something that will come up next year. There'll be something that will come up two years. And it's a living document that you need to keep taking a look at and updating um, as needed. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's the end of my report. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. As I understand, Councilor, there's uh, no actions required at this point. Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All righty. Thank you all very, very much. Um, next, I'm showing the- Mr. Chairman, it may be board members may have a question of, um, of Glenn okay. before he goes away. Any board member? No. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. The uh, next I'm showing is the amendment to Maxwell's general store lease assignment for counselor. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, I would call on our leasing manager, Maria Humphrey, to come give a presentation on this amendment and assignment. Good morning. Uh, this morning, for your consideration, we have an assignment and amendment to one of our Beach Village leases. Last year, sadly, we lost one of our shop owners. Um, his shop was given to his daughter in his will. Uh, he leased it. He leased it under his own name, not under a business name. So it had to go through probate. Um, his daughter is accepting ownership of the store, provided you are okay with the assignment. Um, there were a couple small clerical errors when the original lease was done in the square footage. It was off by three square feet, and the suite number originally listed was incorrect. 
So this amendment will correct those um, inconsistencies uh, and be considered an amendment and assignment if you agree to allow that happen. Council, we're going to need uh, a, a motion on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, any any other questions? And and just to note, staff is recommending uh, approval of this amendment and assignment. Okay. So, what I need is a motion to recommend approving the assignment and amendment of the Maxwell's General Store lease, as recommended by staff. I need a motion. So moved. Been moved. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, I'm going to call for a vote. The um, all those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Mr. Chairman. That concludes our item. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Jones, do I go to you on the uh, 2022 SPLOS list? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your packet, uh, draft page 17, uh, you have a, a copy of a, of a memorandum um, from me, um, and uh, it outlines um, recommended SPLOS projects for consideration by Glenn County for uh, the 2022 SPLOS. Um, um, as you may recall, we have participated in previous uh, SPLOS uh, programs by the county, uh, and uh, we developed the list uh, based on the capital uh, program uh, that you review and update uh, yearly. Uh, that capital program is included in our strategic plan that is presented to the state, and then we look at projects that um, are on that uh, listing that have um, relationship to uh, the greater residency of, of Glenn County uh, as, um, as far as presenting to you projects for consideration for SPLOS. Um, the projects that are listed here are um, the fishing pier renovations, which have been uh, proposed uh, in the past couple of SPLOS uh, 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 efforts. Uh, you see there it's, uh, it's estimated at uh, $1.2 million. Um, bike path completion to the Guest Information Center, uh, that's $502,255. Um, you realize that was a project of the um, Federal T program, which is no longer and uh, you've heard me talk about that we, uh, uh, in accordance with their guidelines, that um, uh, when the project was to be constructed, most of the monies had been spent um, uh, with uh, the design work. And so that's the reason it is, it is an unfinished project. Um, bike paths have been a priority uh, under the um, under past uh, SPLOS programs of the county. And, um, and so while we've been moving forward on our other bike paths, we think this one would be um, a good connector because we are working with DOT uh, on, the, on the idea, on the project of, of moving uh, or of completing the bike path all the way from the Welcome Center uh, to 17. And then once it's at 17, it becomes a part of, of the greater uh, Coastal Greenway uh, path which connects with uh, the city of Brunswick and St. Simons and so the greater of Glen County. So this project seems uh, very appropriate from that standpoint. Um, the third one is um, one that we usually um, have, have not put forward. Usually we've put forward the actual project uh, and not the design and permitting. Uh, but in this case, as you'll recall from the last board meeting, we talked about the bike path at the north end, that once we complete the bike path uh, construction that we're about to be uh, um, beginning, um, and Noel will talk about that a little bit later on, on today's agenda, 
Then the only remaining bike path on the island to be completed is, is the north loop that would go from Dr Driftwood Beach to the, uh, to the fishing pier. So obviously if the fishing pier is improved, it just makes sense that we begin to move in this direction. We know there's a lot of support for this path uh, from uh, guests and residents alike. Um, and yet we also know that this particular path will require not only DNR uh, permits, but it will also require Corps of Engineer permits. So it will be very involved. And um, we also know that um, the design of this path, uh, because of the uh, inundation from the last two hurricanes, um, it, it will be beyond our capabilities on staff. We will have to have a design firm to do this path. So we are, are proposing $245,000 for the design and permitting of that path. I will say to you, however, in a preliminary discussion with our county commission, uh, commissioner from our district, um, he did present to me that, that it could be a possibility that they would rather look at the construction dollars and then have the authority to, um, to uh, as our match, to, do, um, to be responsible for the design and permitting, which of course uh, would be um, something that I would think that you would agree to, um, that because if the construction's over a million dollars, uh, then, then that would be a, a, good, um, a good project for us to partner with in that way, obviously. Um, yet to be determined, obviously, all of these projects, but yet this is the preliminary recommend, recommended list. The fourth one would be sanitary, sanitary sewer line repairs, uh, and that's $1.156 million. So the total that we're presenting to you is $3,104,255.10 as presented. If in fact the, um, the design were to be um, our share and were to be replaced with a million dollars for construction, uh, then the total package would be 3.859 million. Um, and, and since this is, is more of a recommended list, I feel like that it's appropriate that we could, uh, Mr. Chairman, that with your, with your uh, if it's your pleasure, that we could recommend uh, the list um, and, and, and then give the flexibility of, of working with the county on, on either the actual project or uh, construction or the um, design and engineering. Um, there are two additional pages uh, in the memo that uh, is in your packet today, which um, highlight the contributions of Jekyll Island toward uh, Glen County. Uh, and, and you will remember that the Selick Center at the University of Georgia uh, in 2018 did a study of the impacts of Jekyll Island on Glen County and the greater coastal area. And um, that particular um, study found that 22% of the gross sales uh, within Glen County could be attributed to Jekyll and 28.5% of all jobs within the county. Um, and we are, will be proposing uh, in the new budget year for an update of this study uh, from the Selig Center uh, because obviously, um, there have been additional hotels to open on Jekyll since this time, and also with the uh, differences that um, the pandemic has now presented, we think it would be uh, wise to update that study. Uh, but even based on the 2018 numbers, we feel like those numbers are significant. We also know that in 20, uh, FY 2021, uh, $904,323 uh, was levied on property taxes uh, from Jekyll Island uh, to Glen County. And, um, and additionally, uh, the state of Georgia does not, um, does not break out sales taxes from sources uh, as they do in some other states. And so the state um, 
And every time Marjorie tries to get any kind of additional information on this, the state basically gives you a lump sum for the county. And obviously that's um, problematic for us being a subset within the county and not an incorporated city or county uh, to try and get a handle on our, on our uh, impacts as far as um, our sales tax. Um, and so what we've done is um, we have um, retained uh, KB Advisory Group uh, out of Atlanta. They do municipal, um, a lot of municipal economic impact and uh, assessments and, um, and to, uh, re to review uh, our, um, our business community here on Jackal and to uh, extrapolate from, from uh, various sources uh, the estimates of, of, um, uh, of business impact from uh, Jackal's uh, sales tax to Glen County. Uh, it is, um, in, in many cases, it's, it's, it's fairly easily done as far as looking at, um, if you have a big box store, for instance, uh, across the country, there's there's pretty much some standards as far as per square foot, how much those stores generate. And so um, so anyway, looking at some of those kind of um, uh, formula to be able to come forward with um, with numbers. And this is is something that um, uh, was not an expensive study, uh, and um, it. Um, Marjorie, do you remember the cost on that one? Oh yeah, eight thousand seven hundred dollars. It's just a quick analysis, and so we went ahead and just through funds that we uh, that you had, um, had already appropriated for miscellaneous studies this year. We already um, uh, are having this done because obviously we'd like to be able to present that data to uh, to Glen County to to um, uh, boost our our arguments for. Uh, any any splice list that you approve. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I've I've talked beyond just the list today, but to give you some additional information about uh, what we're trying to do to to um, make certain that the data is as absolutely uh, dependable as it can be. Uh, but um, it is our recommendation that that um, the board at least in endorse uh, the listing as <laughs> as presented with the understanding that um, if revisions are made, then we certainly come back um, for a final, but, um, but that we would entertain um, appropriate revisions, for instance, if we were to match the A&E work on the bike path uh, with a proposal from Glen County that may be a construction proposal. Council, would I then go to a... Um a motion to uh, approve the proposed 2022 spots for results of the Glen County Board of Commissioners. Yes, Mr. Chairman, that would be appropriate at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to recommend approval of the proposed 2022 spots <coughs> list for submittal to the Glen County Board of Commissioners as recommended by staff? Mr. Yes. Chairman, I'd make a motion. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. And moved and seconded. I have a motion to recommend approval of the proposed 2022 spots list for submittal to the Glen County Board of Commissioners as recommended by staff. Any discussion? Chair, here's no request for discussion. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, like sign. Motion carries. I'm next going to move to the um, the award recommendation for RFP 368 market analysis for Jekyll Island Amphitheater. Jones. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, members uh, received a, a late notice uh, on on this particular RFP because um, we were frankly um, running up against the wire. Um, uh, on making the final selection, uh, not because the, the proposals weren't good, but because they were very close. Uh, we did receive, let me give you a little background here, Mr. Chairman. Um, you will recall that back in, uh, in last summer, 
uh, we um, issued an RFP uh, for uh, the amphitheater. Uh, when, that, when that particular RFP was issued, it did not have a deadline on it, uh, and we received no responses. Uh, we were just trying to gauge the interests of uh, potential development uh, folks or, or promoters on uh, working with us on the amphitheater. We then revised that particular um, uh, RFP to have a deadline. And uh, when that deadline came, we had received only one proposal and it was not responsive. And so uh, we then went back to the drawing board and, um, and decided that maybe we were looking at the wrong um, information uh, rather than just going straight for a, um, for a, uh, a partner on this, that maybe we needed some additional data and, and additional analysis. Um, so we began to look at the, um, the idea of a market uh, analysis to determine the feasibility. And you actually then approved uh, uh, RFP 368 uh, for a market analysis for the Jekyll Island Amphitheater. And it was issued on January the 19th with a submission deadline of March the 1st. Uh, the idea there was that times have changed and maybe the amphitheater wouldn't be used exactly as it had been in the past. And there are also, um, there are also now um, new competitions as far as entertainment and, and, and new uh, entertainments that we never uh, realized in the past. And so consequently, um, uh, we submitted this RFP and I'm very pleased to let you know, we ended up with seven proposals and all of those um, proposed um, uh, all of the submittals uh, had uh, backgrounds in working with amphitheaters as far as the construction, the, the analysis as far as feasibility, and, and then the, um, uh, the idea of, of working with, um, with production companies and that sort of thing. So um, we, one of the, one of the ideas is uh, from this particular RFP that I think our entire review team was convinced of was that the feasibility analysis basically will let us know um, what the right use is and what the right size is and, and how uh, a design of that amphitheater will either be appropriate for Jekyll or it won't be. Um, so as I indicated, we, we received seven proposals we shortlisted three, and then we had interviews that began last Thursday, uh, as was called for in the RFP. Um, we interviewed three firms, DL Group, a DLR Group, Johnson Consulting, and Hudden. Um, and um, Johnson Consulting and Hudden were both by uh, Zoom calls, and DL Group actually uh, was in person. And which was kind of unique in that we haven't had an in-person um, uh, response to a, um, an RFP now in about two years as a result of the pandemic. But, um, but then yesterday, uh, after all the interviews were concluded, the review group um, went through everything um, that had been submitted and we uh, are unanimous in our, in our recommendation to you uh, for the DL group. Uh, the DL group is out of Cleveland, Ohio, um, and we're very impressed with their proposal, um, and, um, and we're excited about uh, them moving forward. Um, they also broke their proposal down uh, in an interesting way, in that they will do a market and site assessment. And if at the end of that market and site assessment, their recommendation is, this is not going to work, then that's the end of the contract. Um, and that portion of the contract is $29,400. But if in fact their market and site assessment comes forward with a plan that is appropriate and that, uh, and that should be pursued, then we'll have that opportunity to say, 
go forward. And the total then of the entire uh, project would be $68,900, uh, which would include the first phase. Um, and uh, it, it, if in fact the entire project is done, uh, the, uh, there will be um, uh, pro forma, uh, uh, financial pro forma uh, as part of the, um, of the operating plan, uh, as well as initial design work. And, um, and so we're, we're excited about the opportunity to finally take this project uh, to the next step. Uh, so our recommendation, Mr. Chairman, is that, that um, uh, contingent upon uh, uh, actual uh, contract, final contract uh, review and negotiation and legal uh, review that, um, that we enter into a contract with DL Group uh, DLR group um, uh, to to conduct the market assessment. That is DLR. Yes, group. sir. Thank you, okay. Councilor. I guess I need a motion. I, yes, Mr. Chairman, that would be appropriate. Thank you. Is there a motion to recommend awarding RFP three sixty eight to uh, DLR group? Pending a contract completion and legal review. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Jones, quick yes. question. Is most of the parking, would the parking be in the rear of the administration or collectively? Well, parking would be one of the issues that would, if you get into the second phase, that they would look at. Because obviously on Jekyll Island, um, well, maybe not so obviously, but but we would not um, we would want to limit just a massive number of cars parking um, uh, for a, a performance. Instead, um, you know, there may be um, options such as shuttle services and things like that. Any other questions? OK, so we're looking at um, a motion to recommend awarding RFP 368 the DLR group pending contract completion and legal review. I have uh, been moved and seconded. Any discussion, further discussion? Let's vote. All in favor of this motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed like sign? Motion carries, thank you. Um, next, I was gonna go to Noel. Um, and no actions required, but an operations update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give a, a quick project update. As uh, Jones likes to mention from time to time, it's never a dull moment working for the authority. We always have something going on. We always have something in queue. We always have something in the future we're shooting towards. So this is just kind of a quick and dirty overview of some things that are taking place right now. And on the left, you see a listing of projects that are either currently underway or on, in the process of, of getting underway. The crossovers are substantially complete with the exception of some repairs that we're going through. And if you remember that state bond money that was associated with the, with the revetment and um, we have a good accounting of how much money we have left. So we're kind of going back through crossovers and fine tuning the, the crossovers and doing some repairs that we've had from some storm damage. The convention center furniture is partially complete. You saw it when you came in, there's new furniture spread around. We're waiting on some tables to, uh, to come in to accent those, those place settings around the convention center. Five Hayes was a property that we demolished and a residential property we demolished and it, we received a, a successful bid for that property and they've since put a house on that property and uh, are nearing completion. The Moorings uh, has just recently started on building A, which is the last building. And it's a large building of similar in nature to building B, which was the first large building that they built. And that'll complete the Moorings. Public, work, uh, public works offices, which you've funded in the past, Campground expansion, which I updated you on last board meeting, the public safety complex of which you're keenly aware of, of which Mr. Hooks mentioned was hopefully 100% funded by uh, 
the legislature. The airport terminal building, which I'll be in front of you next um, month with our uh, pond group, who is our airport engineer and GDOT to recommend uh, a responsive low bidder to the, to the design build contract. Airport hangars, which will be a public private partnership, which you've committed some site work money to in a, a past budget that we we're looking to see going away. The Georgia Sea Turtle Center expansion, which is an exciting project that we are in the infancy of trying to get some schematics that we would um, turn over to the foundation to uh, to look into fundraising for. Uh, Causeway Billboard, which is a project that we've had on the books since pre-pandemic. And um, every time we've uh, re received funding and went to contract, that steel prices or something else has been negatively affected. So we never had enough money to get to the altar with that project, but uh, hopefully we'll have resolution of that soon. And probably the most important project on this list, um, lightning rod wise has been the water tower for rehabilitation, which has been slow going due to subcontracting and issues with, with, with COVID-19. But more importantly, that picture on the right, which is a temporary cell tower and that is Verizon's temporary cell tower. If you recall, I mentioned that they had originally not raised it to its full elevation. They raised it to 95 feet. It should have been um, at 123 feet, which is a which doesn't sound like a lot of distance, but it's enough distance to take it to where it's not shooting in the trees anymore. It's shooting a signal above the treetops. Well, yesterday, that is a picture that was sent to me by our water wastewater superintendent Alan Thurston. And that's a man basket with a crane. And I've been told that they have raised that tower to the maximum allowed elevation by the FAA. So hopefully if you're at the Marriott um, and on the south end, you should be getting a, a decent signal from Verizon. And uh, that'll clear a lot of uh, comments and inquiries that we receive from the hotels and guests and just in general. So, Noel, that, that tower was at 95 when they first um, installed it, and then it went to 115, or and now it's taller? Or, or is they, it? Yes, sir. They initially raised it to 115, but the winds were too strong to get up the rest of the way, and they needed a man basket, so they abandoned trying to get it the rest of the way up. And then yesterday, they finally came back out with the man basket to, to uh, raise it the rest of the way. And I do want to reiterate... Um, some comments that we've had internally and just to remind the general public and the board that those cell towers, those temporary cell towers are not of our doing. Uh, that is Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile or whoever it is manipulating their cell tower. They lease the water tower space to put their antennas on and in their contract, if we decide to rehabilitate the water tower, it's their duty to temporarily provide service on their contract or subcontractors temporary tower. So that is a, that is their solution. And these, these, this was some interesting lessons learned from our standpoint, because when we leave this tower, we're heading south and we're going to do water tower five and water tower five has quite a bit of antenna on it that shoots cell signals over St. Simon's Island. So I'm sure that would be a great impact if one of the carriers was supposed to repeat what happened at, at the Jekyll Island Tower. We would have uh, the Pier Village and um, that whole area around Neptune Park would not be receiving certain cell service because they're shooting off of our tower on the south end, which a lot of people don't realize. So we're going to try to get out ahead of that subject and make sure everybody's at the height that they're supposed to be. Hey, no, one more question yes, uh, for the board related to that. Um, what's the latest as far as that water tower rehabilitation? What, what are you hearing we had, from? We had a kickoff meeting with Suez at the beginning of, the, of March, and they're committing to us that by the uh, second week of August, that they will be 100% complete and, and demobilizing from the area. And we expressed upon them that hurricane season, and they're well aware. But uh, I, I just wanted to get that on the record with with them during the kickoff meeting that, you know, you're really pushing the outer limits of what you should um, be handling a water tower in hurricane season. So especially one sitting right on the coast. And the last thing I wanted to cover was uh, just to show 
uh, two pieces of equipment that we just received in the past couple of weeks. On the left is our brand new backhoe, which replaced the one that we had since 1994 that was um, um, ceremoniously um, taken out of service or not so ceremoniously, depending on how you look at it. And on the right hand side is the vacuum truck, which is a first for Jekyll Island. And that vacuum truck resides at water wastewater. And um, that's an important piece of equipment that we've never really had. We've had a little trailer mounted sewer jet that we can go clear blockages with. But this piece of equipment, it's um, over $300,000. And we were able to use a state contract to do a lease purchase. So we'll lease it for seven years and then we'll buy it for a dollar which is a pretty good deal. And um, the service life on that is up to 20 years. So we'll definitely get our use out of it. But typically in the past when we've reached blockages that we can't cure with our little trailer mounted um, jet, which doesn't really have a lot of power, we'd have to call a joint water sewer and they charge us by the hour to come over here and handle that. And it also gives us the flexibility to look at other things such as uh, stormwater drains that the authority maintains and uh, water line breaks and things of that nature. So that, that piece of equipment, uh, water and wastewater is getting trained on and we're excited to have that. And we're appreciative of the, the boards um, listening to needs that we have as far as equipment goes and trying to help uh, the public works departments uh, get better with equipment and work a little bit smarter and not harder. So I certainly appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just three quick items uh, under my report. Uh, RFP 369, Georgia Sea Turtle Center Affiliate Scientist Update. Uh, you approved this, um, this RFP. And then after um, consultation uh, with uh, representatives of the Turtle Center and Conservation Department and Legal Department, we um, have put this on hold until we have a little more, uh, a little better direction. Uh, from uh, conservation and the Turtle Center as far as exactly um, how this um, affiliate position will work. So uh, a little more clarity, uh, uh, Zach felt like was needed. And, and so I, I am very, uh, um, very much in agreement that we, we just wait on issuing that. Uh, so just an update for you there. Um, also golf improvement strategy, um, you know that we um, had an archaeological study update done, uh, consulting group, Terracon. They've been working on their revised report to, uh, to send to the State Historic Preservation Office in response to uh, SHPO's uh, comments uh, and requests for additional information from SHPO. Uh, and we have not received that report yet. Um, and, and so we're waiting on them to get it uh, finalized and back to SHPO. So uh, nothing new to report there. I do anticipate that at next month's meeting, uh, we'll have an update from the National Golf Foundation consulting uh, group uh, on, the, um, on the review they've been doing uh, to update the study that they did uh, now about six years ago. Uh, looking at our golf courses. And, and so I think that'll be a very interesting um, presentation that they'll make um, next month. Uh, they also will, um, uh, well, their report that they're working on, their update will um, uh, look at the uh, uh, impacts of the pandemic on golf, not only uh, throughout the country, but also specifically on Jekyll Island. So uh, stay tuned for that. The one other thing besides the uh, sheets that are um, in your in your file, uh, in your blue folder that I've already mentioned, such as the public comments, um, there is um, uh, an interesting piece of data in your packet today, um, page, uh, draft page 10. Uh, it's the uh, convention center uh, updates. I wanted to call your attention to, to the fact that if you look at event days, um, that we're beginning to be, um, we're beginning to be back in, in uh, 20, uh, equal to 2019, FY 2019, uh, which was a, a very good year. Of course, then uh, 20 was skewed because the first half of 20 was, 
was you know full throttle and then and then it was a total pullback so so 20 is a very difficult year to follow but but looking at 19 and then you look at fy 22 and you look at attendance numbers uh, while they're still down um the event days are, are approaching 19 and and revenues uh look good and and square feet utilized too so um so we're making good progress at, at having groups back but um but obviously i'm still not where we were earlier but uh, certainly something to be aware of and no doubt the numbers will be uh smaller because if you spread everybody out like this uh, <laughs> with <laughs> with the audience chairs today it's uh the numbers are always going to be smaller but mr chairman that concludes my report unless there are questions any questions thank you um my comments um i um it, as you all know um there the um the chair this many other commissions is uh, term limited and um so i'm waiting to hear what um the, the i will probably rotate off uh, or at least well, i won't be chair um and uh so forth but uh it, i just want to remind each and every one of you when um i went to see governor deal i was debating about retiring and when i asked i said i don't mean to be presumptuous but i really do want to be in this authority i love the foundation and and so forth and uh so um i can't thank you all enough and and as i said I can never say it enough that this staff is just beyond remarkable and and george is so lucky to have to have this staff um i'm going to open the floor for public comment uh public comments are limited to three minutes for each person we would ask that you uh, identify yourself so we know who we're hearing from good morning my name is al tate i'm a permanent resident on Jekyll Island. I rise to comment on the ordinance revision update. Uh, from what we saw presented this morning, this update is going to be very extensive. It's going to be impacting every thing, including the Jekyll Island Authority, the residents, visitors, and everybody to a pretty significant degree. So, then I look and see that they're wanting to have the uh, first public meeting in just a little over a month, and or is it even less than a month? And that is going to be a significant problem in the making, I'm afraid, because the all the organizations on Jekyll Island and the things you don't think about sometimes, for example, the churches, uh, the art association, some of the clubs that uh, participate uh, are all going to be impacted by this. And often that will impact will be in ways unforeseen by the group that's working on these ordinances. We need to have good, clear communication between these people that have a stake, all our stakeholders and this ordinance preparation, which means that there needs to be an adequate time for them to have input into this process. One month since many of these organizations meet on a monthly basis means that they will not have an opportunity to get together with their group and interact about what's going on with these. So I would suggest that the authority and the, the folks working with this, the GMC folks, make an extra, extra effort to communicate with our Jekyll Island Citizens Association and stakeholder groups to urge them to take a close look at these, to prepare this draft so that we can have a draft at least one month ahead of any public meeting instead of trying to just rush this through. If you don't, I think there's going to be real trouble with what these ordinances uh, do when they actually go into effect. So I would urge you to have consideration of writing letters, uh, perhaps communicating and offering feedback opportunity to these organizations especially. So that's uh, 
my concern. The other thing I think that you need to think about is that it, when these ordinances go into effect, there's going to be a necessity for considerably more administrative hours, enforcement, back, uh, additional enforcement activity, and that's either going to mean more staff or a lot more uh, workload for staff that you have. My comment. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Anybody else? We need a break. Okay, you got somebody else coming up. I guess. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jim Clipple, 5 Clark Street. Thank you for everything. Uh, just a couple comments. Thank you so much for the Terrapin project. Uh, one suggestion is during Terrapin season, maybe we reduce the speed limit on the causeway from 55 to 45 at certain times. Um, also, Jace, uh, in, re regarding the marketing for, uh, for our treasured uh, 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 north end uh, feature, which is the Driftwood Beach, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a very fine area in uh, South Carolina called Botany Bay has a similar type of uh, facility. Uh, feature. And um, they have an, a natural sign staff that stays there to communicate with people about the assets there. They also have uh, strict regulations about cutting the, the, uh, the driftwood and also taking shells. So people have adopted finding whelk shells and so forth and just decorating the trees with it. And it's uh, quite spectacular. Since we have such a great feature here on the island, uh, one thought would be to maximize the protection of it and also um, in, in, uh, uh, in a more passive marketing, uh, make it aware that uh, it's, it's a very treasured uh, asset to our community. Also, since uh, we're highlighting the, the movie production on the island right now, Jekyll has a, a very rich uh, movie production history. And I think that there's a, possibility that there could be some type of tour or emphasis on on a producing some type of literature or something that showed uh, areas of significance where films were made such as Bagger Vance and the X-Men and and then this movie too and also uh, take advantage of potential income from post production where uh, maybe these houses could be open to the public for pictures or just communication and uh, marketing. Thank you very much. Thank you. As the uh, author of the Freshwater Turtle Protection Act, I really appreciate uh, that uh, mention on the Terrapins. Um, I'm going to open the uh, March 15, 2022 board meeting of the Jekyll Island Authority. We will uh, now call the roll. Yes, sir. Mr. Joseph B. Wilkinson, Jr. Here. Mr. Bob Kruger. Here. Mr. Bill Gross. Here. Commissioner Mark Williams. Here. Ms. Joy Birch Meeks. Here. Dr. Buster Evans. Here. Mr. Glenn Willard. Here. Mr. Dale Atkins. Here. Mr. Tripp Tolleson is absent today. Sir, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. The uh, action items. The uh, minutes of the February 15, 2022 board meeting. I need a motion and a second to um, approve the minutes of the February 15, 2022 board meeting. Is there a motion? Move to approve the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Chair, I'm going to call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes of the February 15, 2022 board meeting will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, like sign, motion carries. We have a uh, request for EMS training equipment. Um, I can tell you some stories from the Navy of uh, this equipment and thank goodness I'm so glad someone requested this um, board members have received a finance committee recommendation to authorize the purchase of an all-in-one sim mannequin for the purpose of EMS training is there any further discussion before a vote to accept this 
recommendation. No second is needed. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, all right, we're going to back to the amendment to Maxwell's general store lease assignment. Board members have received a committee of the whole recommendation to approve the assignment and amendment of the Maxwell's general store lease. Is there any further discussion before a vote to accept the recommendation? I don't need a motion or a second. No, okay. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? I don't think I've heard. Is that even local? No, no, sir. Okay. All right. So the motion carries. Um, the um, proposed 2022 spots list, board members have received a committee of the whole recommendation to approve the proposed 2022 spots. Um, submittal, oh, excuse me, the SPLOS list for submittal to the Glen County Board of Commissioners. Any further discussion before a vote to accept uh, the recommendation? No motion or second is needed. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? Motion carries. Um, the award recommendation for RFP 368 market analysis for Jekyll Island Amphitheater. Board members have received a committee of the whole recommendation to award to award RFP 368 to DLR group um, pending contract completion and legal review. Is there any further discussion before a vote to accept the recommendation? Chair, sure, there's none. No motion or second is needed. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like sign, the motion carries. And now we get to Mr. Kruger's favorite part. Is there a motion to Why adjourn? I'm sorry. Oh, please. Um, good morning. My name is David Youngblood. I didn't realize I, I tried to get on the permission to come up and talk to you guys. Good. And I did not realize I thought I was on the agenda. Um, I would like to talk to the board about renewing uh, the lease on my property. I currently own 912 North Beachview Drive. Um, the property has been in our house in our name since uh, 1968. Um, my mother was the owner of the house until recently she passed. During the renewal of the leases, um, I, I feel that she was beginning to maybe have a little bit of uh, dementia. I don't know why she didn't renew the lease. Um, currently, I would like to sell the house to my daughter. Um, unfortunately, there's only 27 years left on this lease. Um, she needs, because of the cost and all that, we would like to see if she could get a 30 year mortgage, but she can't because of the uh, time constraints on the lease. So um, the options that we've been given would be to renew the lease is at 5% of the current assessed land value by the county. Um, this translates into roughly $7,600 a year versus the lease that we're currently paying, which is around $400, a little bit more. Um, I understand that the lease is redone 12 years ago, and I would like to uh, see if there's any way that we could go back to, you know, try to get into that type of lease. I think paying over a 1,300% higher taxes than a typical homeowner pays on Jekyll. It's a uh, financial hardship it would be for my daughter and for me. Um, I mean, or we could just, you know, continue the lease at 27 years, but we're also going to come into this in 27 years. Um, I would just like for the board to maybe reconsider and see if there's an option that we can pursue. Um, like I said, we've been on the island since 1968. 
and uh, this would be a third generation going into this house. And, you know, we love this island. We've been here a long time and, and we're going to remain here. And uh, love to see all the stuff that's going on. And uh, if you would just take that into consideration uh, and give me some advisement, um, I would appreciate it. I uh, well remember when all this took place and uh, I was still in the house and uh, man alive, that was, that was something. Um, I don't know that we can, that was what we can do. All right, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Youngblood has given you a public comment. Um, uh, your policies don't, uh, except in uh, cases of emergency or uh, compelling extenuating circumstances, you're uh, generally uh, are not permitted to take up action uh, requested during a public comment. That's one of your yeah, policies that, are, that was adopted by the board. Um, I, you, the board can certainly consider it at a different time, but uh, for purposes of today's meeting, uh, the effect is a uh, member of the public has given you a public comment. Uh, you've heard it. And, and that's kind of the, the end of the matter for purposes of today's meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, what is the time? 1116. 1116 daylight savings. And uh, so this. Uh, we need a second. Yeah. Second. We move and second that we adjourn. Any discussion? All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Like sign. Okay. So we are adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me remind board members that there is a work session it is scheduled in room one two. Um, beginning in 15 minutes, and um, it is work session for the board. Obviously, uh, it's in the public, uh, so uh, you've got about 15 minutes, and then we'll see you there. Uh, for those on the phone, there is a, a phone uh, opportunity, right, Anna? Yes, um, you can hang up and then call in the same number in about 15 minutes.